Hello, and welcome to Writers and Books Visiting Author Series. My name is Dan Hurd. I'm the Director of Adult Programs. Writers and Books is a nonprofit literary arts center in Rochester, New York. We offer readings, workshops, and literary programming for people of all ages and backgrounds. You can find more information at our website, wab.org. Please say hello in the chat and let us know you're there. You can also submit questions through our, the chat or the Q&A function. Books are available through our bookstore, Ampersand Books. I'll put the links in the chat. Writers and Books would like to call attention to the complex and troubled history of the lands on which we live and work. We are hosting this event from the unceded ancestral homelands of the Onondaga, or the people of the Great Hill. We're so happy to have Reina Grande with us this evening. She'll be in conversation with Maria Amparo Escandone. Maria Amparo Escandone is the author of L.A. Weather, Esperanza's Box of Saints, and Gonzalez and Daughter Trucking Company. Named a writer to watch by both Newsweek and the L.A. Times, she was born in Mexico City and has lived in Los Angeles for nearly four decades. Reina Grande's new novel, A Ballad of Love and Glory, is a sweeping historical saga following a Mexican army nurse and an Irish soldier who must, who must fight at first for their survival, then for their love, amidst the atrocity of the Mexican-American War. Reina Grande is an award-winning author, motivational speaker, and writing teacher. As a young girl, she crossed the US-Mexico border to join her family in Los Angeles, a harrowing journey chronicled in The Distance Between Us, a National Book Critics Circle Award finalist and Writers and Books 2018 Rochester Reads selection. Her other books include the novels Across a Hundred Mountains and Dancing with Butterflies, the memoirs The Distance Between Us Young Readers Edition, and A Dream Called Home, and the anthology Somewhere We Are Human, Authentic Voices on Migration, Survival, and New Beginnings. She lives in Woodland, California with her husband and two children. Raina, thank you so much for being here and congratulations on the book. Thank you so much uh, for hosting us. It's uh, such a pleasure to be here in conversation with my mentor, Maria Amparo Escandon. We've known each other for a very long time and it's just so wonderful to be part of this uh, community of, of writers, especially Chicana, Latina writers and being able to you know support each other uplift each other celebrate each other's stories so thank you so much for joining us and thank you maria for agreeing to be in conversation with me today thank you reina and thank you writers and books uh, for hosting this event uh, i must say reina that uh saying that that I was your men I was your mentor many many years ago <laughs> so, this is one of those cases where the mentee surpasses the mentor I mean you have amassed a wonderful body of work uh very amazing your last book um a ballad of love and glory is just uh, an incredible testament of the power of love. And I think that uh, that's for me the takeaway, the big takeaway is um, how, how love is able to flourish in the middle of a war. And I just, I just, you had me at the first line, you know, I was so, so enthralled and uh, read uh, your book with with much attention and just enjoyed it very much. And so I'm happy to be here. And uh, I have questions. I have questions. Uh, I know we've talked about your book a lot in different events where we've met and things like that. Uh, but I want to um, ask you some of those questions uh, here so that uh, the readers and the audience uh, can think about that as well. Um, I've always wondered, you know, when you read a historical novel, you know, uh, and, and I love historical novels, 
I've always wondered, what are the author's parameters to determine how much of the story is fact and how much is fiction? So how did you reach this perfect balance in a ballad of love and glory? Yeah, so that is a question that I'm still asking myself if I did, so thanks so much. <laughs> because I know like, I know there, there are some readers who go into it thinking it's a romance and then they're shocked that there's so much history, that there's a lot of battle scenes, there's a lot of violence because the book deals with an invasion and we know invasions are violent and brutal but they want more romance, more love and less war. And then there are other readers who really love the war, who really love all the history and, and, um, and, and, you know, and they're not asking for more romance. They felt that, that, that there was enough romance there mm -hmm. to, to really drive the book, drive the story without losing like all of that history and and all of those uh, the politics right um the social political commentary that i offer in the book to me was really important and when i was writing it i really wanted i didn't want it to be a love story with the war as a backdrop i wanted it to be a war story infused with romance and that, that was my intention. And, and, and that's kind of how I executed the, the story. That's the execution. That was my vision. So don't go thinking it's a romance because it's not. Um, so what I ended up doing was I really wanted to bring to life this time period in history that has been forgotten. You know, the, the US invasion of Mexico of 1846, which lasted two years and resulted in Mexico losing half of its territory to the United States. It has been forgotten. It has been erased from our collective consciousness. And so people don't, here in the US, we don't really learn about it in our US history classes. And I had to take a history of Mexico class in college to learn about this. Um, so what I wanted to do was to immerse the reader in this time period to teach the reader about this history that they probably were not taught or didn't really know much about. And I wanted to be accurate. So I did not manipulate the events. I didn't distort the events in order for, for them to fit my love story you know I fit the love story within the historical timeline and I respected the way that the events unfolded and I never messed around with with the historical timeline at all so the way you see the events unfolding that's really how they unfolded in real time and I added my love story between this Irishman, John Riley, and the Mexican army nurse, Jimena, and I wove it into that history. Um, yeah, so uh, it, was, it was challenging to do at first, but once I figured out how, how to fit my plot within that context, it kind of started to work. And it took me seven years to get it to to this stage, but um, I think it was really worth the effort and I learned a lot, a, a lot of history. And it also helped me to step out of my comfort zone and challenge myself as a writer, you know, because writing historical fiction is a really challenging genre. I had no experience writing this genre my comfort zone is memoir or, or auto fiction. You know, it, my fiction up to this point had been all about me based on my own experiences. So this is actually my first time that I had to do an incredible amount of research. And I read about a hundred books and a bunch of articles and a bunch of uh, primary sources like di soldiers' diaries and letters that they wrote home. So it was very intense, 
but I ended up learning a lot during this process. Well, it totally shows. Uh, and I, I love the fact that you, even though you acknowledge what the readers want, and then there are readers who want more romance and readings, readers who want more historical facts and, and the war, uh, you went with your own gut and you, your, own, uh, your own approach uh, to writing this book and respecting history uh, to the most, you know, uh, uh, to the highest level, and and then weaving the the romance part into it in in a fictional way, which is really, you know, it must have been tricky because you are dealing with a historical hero who is real and a fictional character, which is Jimena, and so. It, it, it really it really plays well you really it's so believable and and I just loved it uh, but I did also love the whole thing about the war and and you touch on a very uh, important um, topic and I mean why do you think uh, this war was forgotten we're currently witnessing a horrible land grab by Putin's regime trying to take, a piece or all of Ukraine, and most Americans are horrified and angry at this unjust and violent act. But not long ago, the United States took half of Mexico's territory in a brutal war. And my question to you is, has this part of our history been forgotten or played down deliberately? What was your impression when you were researching for this book, was this a motivation for you to write this story for us to remember, to, to mm -hmm. have it present so it never happens again? I mean, we're talking about what happened, what is happening now, it's, it's, a, it's a colonial grab. Putin mm -hmm. is trying to colonize uh, an right. independent nation. And back in and, the day- Yeah, and I didn't know that I, that's what I was, but I, that's what I was going into was writing a book about U.S. imperialism yes. and writing about how Mexico was a victim of U.S. imperialism and aggression. Um, so, I mean, the way I, I kind of made my way into the book was that I heard about the St. Patrick's Battalion and I had never heard of them. And this was back in 2013. Somebody asked me if I had ever heard of the St. Patrick's Battalion. And I, I said, no, I haven't. And they told me, right, it, it was a, a unit of um, mostly Irish men who had deserted the US Army and joined the Mexican ranks to help Mexico defend itself against the US invaders. Which in itself is, amazing <laughs> it is. Yeah. And, and, and yeah and when I heard about it I was like wait what like there were some Irishmen who deserted and then they joined the Mexicans and then I started asking like why like why would they do that and and I I researched um, John Riley and the St. Patrick's Battalion and I just really fell in love with their story but then I realized that I didn't really know anything about the Mexican-American war so then I wanted to learn more about it and I started reading more and more about it. And then I realized that, you know, I need to write a book about this because it, we, we really don't have much literature about the Mexican-American War. We have a ton of novels about the world wars, you know, I mean, look at how many, how many um, novels come out about World War II that have Paris on the cover. And, um, and then there's a lot of novels on the Civil War, but there's like hardly anything on the Mexican-American War. I am so shocked uh, by this. Uh, and, and that was one of the questions that I wanted to ask you if, you know, how did you, de what did you find in your research? Did you find that it was, it's become, become an obscure war? Mm -hmm. uh, because it's been downplayed and just shoved aside. Yeah, 
I mean, I, it has been a deliberate erasure from our history. I mean, you know, the, the U.S. is really good at cherry picking. It's parts of the history that it wants us to know and then erasing everything else or downplaying everything else. And obviously this particular moment in history, it doesn't fit into the national mythology. Um, you know, this was the first time that the United States invaded a sovereign nation when it occupied Mexico City in, in September of 1847. It was the first time the United States occupied a foreign capital. And, you know, they also don't want us thinking about the fact that a big part of the United States used to belong to Mexico, right? That it used to be Mexico. And to me, in erasing this history, it has done a lot of harm to the Mexican people because now we have been recast as the invaders, right? So that when people look at Mexicans, they don't see somebody who belongs here, you know, who, who belongs in this country. They always see us as outsiders, as trespassers. And then when we talk about immigration, you know, especially like Mexican immigration or Latino immigration, we're always painted as the invaders who are coming here to invade these lands. And then if you think about, for example, the shooter at El Paso, at the Walmart in El Paso, like he, he did it because he said he wanted to stop the Hispanic invasion of Texas. And then I thought this idiot doesn't know his history. You know, there is no Hispanic invasion of Texas. Texas was Mexico. We've been there. Um, so anyway, it just makes me really angry. <laughs> so I use a lot of this anger to kind of write this novel because I, I wanted people to start rethinking what they know about U.S. and Mexico relations, to rethink what they know about the southern border and maybe offer him, offer people a corrective history on the southern border. And then it also helped me on a personal level because as I wrote this novel and I learned this history and I reclaimed this history, it helped me to reframe the way I see myself as a Mexican living in California. So it empowered me as well um, writing this book. Well, that is, uh, I'm, I'm so glad you're doing this. This work is very important. And I myself, uh, you know, when, when I read your book, of course I read it and I researched as I read because I wanted to know more. I wanted to know, okay, who is this John Riley? I wanna meet this guy, you know? <laughs> Me too. <laughs> And the way you portray him is like, oh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and I did, I did learn a lot. And it's so interesting to see how different the story is told in Mexico's books. You know, and, and you, you think, okay, yeah, his story is written by the winner, you know. Uh, but, uh, you know, people who, who lost and they lost their identity, they lost their country, they lost their land. They had to, a lot of them had to immigrate south because, um, you know, it, mm. the land became very hostile to them. You know, if you had your little ranch somewhere and you had the bad luck of having gold in your land, you would be killed. You mm -hmm. would be killed by the, you know, by the 49ers and the gold diggers. And it was just horrible in here in California. And mm -hmm. so I, 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 it really got me going, you know, to, to doing more and more research. And it's very inspiring for me. So we've talked about how you got started in this idea, what inspired you. And I think it's a very important reason. And, um, commend you for that mm -hmm. and uh and i i i don't know would you like to read something would you like to read a yeah. couple of passages i am very interested yes. in, in in hearing you read i i actually heard your voice when i was re reading it because Aww. i know your voice and 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 
the narrator was you, you know, in a way I, I kept hearing you, but I would love to hear you now. All right, thank you. So, okay, I'm gonna, the first, I'll read two passages. The first one I'll read is from Jimena's point of view. Um, and so when you meet Jimena, she's living in a ranch with her husband, Joaquin, just north of the Rio Grande. You know, she lives there in that, that region. And then Taylor comes down with his troops and he sets up, a, a, he starts building a fort right across Matamoros. And the fort became Brownsville, Texas, as we know it today. So the, the American troops come down and he, uh, Joaquin, Jimena's husband joins the guerrilla to try to get the Yankee troops out of there, out of their lands because they know what's coming. And he joins the guerrilla. And um, anyway, Jimena's not happy about that because she's worried about you know what's gonna happen to her husband who's out there uh, waging a guerrilla war with the US army. And so here's a little conversation between them. Before long, she was guiding her horse out of the stables and into the approaching dawn as the last stars faded and the grays gave way to violets and reds and golds. She and Joaquin watched as the sun peaked over the prairie and its first rays fell over their house, the huts of the ranch hands, the wells, the barn and stables, the corrals, the pig pens, the grove of pecan trees, the fruit trees and the cultivated fields the open range and the river beyond. Then suddenly the entire rancho was illuminated, their land, their home. Bathed in the morning sunlight, Jimena prayed for God to bless her with children. She prayed for the day when she and Joaquin could take their sons and daughters on a ride like this one, where they could all listen to the raucous calls of the chachalacas nesting in the wisaches, bursting in vivid yellow blooms and inhaled the crisp fragrance of the dewy morning as they watched the prairie quivering with life. She imagined their children riding along on their bay ponies. She would point out to them the doe and her twin fans grazing on the white flowers of a black brush, the bees burrowing in the violet flowers of a guayacan the prairie chickens chasing fluttering grasshoppers. You knew it was a bad idea to get involved with the gorillas, Joaquin said, breaking her reverie. As you have discussed it with you first, I'm sorry, mi amor. She took her eyes off the turkey vulture circling in the distance and turned to look at him. I was wrong, but Jimena, Please understand that I'm not the one putting our future at risk. That happened the minute the Yankees arrived. You more than anyone know what will happen if their invasion succeeds. We will lose everything. What kind of man will I be, cariño, if I don't at least try to protect what's ours? She thought about her dream of the battlefield, the booming of the cannons, the smoke as menacing as storm clouds. But there's nothing you can do to stop what's coming, Joaquin. Neither of us can. His eyes paled, and for a second, his eyes flared like hot coals. He put spurs to his horse and started off without her to the fields. She watched him go, and then suddenly, he pulled on the reins. She caught up to him and saw something her dreams hadn't warned her about. Among the recently planted fields, some of the food high corn stalks and bean stalks had been flattened or uprooted, the soil trampled by horses that had evidently ridden over it in circles. The stench of blood reached them and she and Joaquin galloped on past the brush fence, following the scavenging birds to the prairie where the branded cattle had been grazing the day before. The grasses and wild rye were speckled red with blood. Some of the cattle had been slaughtered and were being feasted upon by turkey vultures and caracaras. 
the rest of the herd was missing, either wandered off from home or taken. Comanches, she asked. Joaquin shook his head. No, los rinches. Rangers here on our land? I didn't want to worry you, but the Texas Rangers who come down with Taylor had been roaming wild, destroying property, violating women, killing innocents. The Texians have volunteered in the US Army, coming in that guise to seek that personal revenge. Revenge for what? She said, haven't we hurt each other enough? Joaquin looked at her, impatient with her question. And then she realized he was right. The Alamo, Goliath, Mir. The Texians would never stop trying to avenge the deaths of their friends and relatives. Make no mistake, mi amor, Joaquin said, reaching for her hand. Texas knew what it was doing when it gave up its rights to govern itself. Under the flag of the United States, the Texians are hoping to settle old scores and get rid of us once and for all. And no matter how many of us they kill, it will never be enough, she said. Okay. Ay, 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 ay. Well, <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's, that's a, a very poignant passage and, um, Yeah, I mean, I think, you think, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, it took me so long to figure out Jimena's story because, you know, she's based on a poem written by John Greenleaf Whittier. And the poem is basically about this woman, Jimena, who's in the battlefield tending to the wounded from both sides. And she's out there with other Mexican women. Um, and when I found that poem, I, I just, I knew I had found my, my female protagonist. You know, I was so um, blown away by thinking about this woman, Jimena, and I was wondering, well, what is she doing in the battlefield? How did she get there? Who did she lose during this war? What's her story? And it took me so long to finally like pin down what her story was. And one of the most important things that I discovered was um, I was I was doing research on the Mexican American War was how this conflict, what set the stage for this conflict was the Texas Rebellion. And you know, the role that the Mexican Texans played during the rebellion and how they allied themselves with the white Texans to, to, to break away from the Mexican government. And then once Texas gained its independence, the white Texans didn't want the Mexican Texans in Texas at all. And they were, most of them were ran out, were ran out of the new Republic, you know? Right. And once I realized the history of, of that moment, the Texas rebellion, the role that the Mexican Texans played in it and how they were betrayed, um, I realized Jimena had to be from Texas. Uh, Jimena's family had to have taken part in the rebellion. And this is something that haunts her throughout the novel is knowing that her own family betrayed Mexico by forming an allegiance with the, with the white Texans. And then what happened to them after, you know? And um, so, she ends up joining the Mexican army as a way to redeem her, her family from what it did before in betraying Mexico. So that's something that's driving her and it's haunting her. And then it's through her story that then the reader gets to understand what led up to this moment. And, um, and it also comes into play later once she is forced to become Santa Ana's personal nurse, all this backstory about Texas comes into play because then she gets to question Santa Ana about his mishandling of the Texas rebellion and the massacre at the Alamo and at Goliad and how, you know, the, the, um, the carnage and bloodshed that he created in Texas kind of 
led um, or set the stage for what was happening now in terms of this invasion. Yeah, I love, I love, I love all these, how you um, got inspired by the poem and how she starts out as a married woman, as a woman who has a homestead, a place where she lives in Texas and, in, and, and a family and how the whole thing evolves. I love that. I think um, you did a great job there. Do you have another passage you'd like to read? Um, well, maybe I'll skip it because I think we only have about 15 minutes or so to, um, to get some questions from the audience. And there's a question that I see on the chat from Viviana. She says, is John Riley and Jimena's love story at all inspired by your own love story with your husband, Corey? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> um, sort of. I think what happened, I mean, Corey definitely served as inspiration for John Riley because um, John Riley, who's a real historical figure, I when I was when I was like trying to think about what kind of man he was, the two people that came to mind was my father and my husband. So I gave a little bit of each to Riley. So in terms of my father, what I gave him was um, my father's uh, story of immigrating to the United States and leaving his wife and children behind in extreme poverty. And he came here to try to find a better life for his family. And then once he was here, he met a nurse and fell in love with this nurse. And eventually he left my mother for this woman, you know, and, and it totally devastated my mother. So then John Riley, when as I was writing him, it's a similar story. You know, he comes from Ireland. He leaves his wife and children behind in extreme poverty. And he comes here to try to find a better life for his family. Then he meets Jimena, who's an army nurse, and he falls in love with her. And then there's a, that inner turmoil. But he's a better man than my father ever was. And he and John Riley honors his marriage oath as much as he can. And that's where I got the inspiration from my husband, because my husband is one of the most honorable men I ever met. And, um, and so I gave a lot of his traits to John Riley in terms of, you know, he, he's a man of honor. He has a very strong moral compass. You know, he, he's very respectful. And, and he's a man of integrity. And th these are some of the, the character traits that, that my husband has. So I gave those to Riley. And yeah, and um, I think one of the, the reasons why, and, 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 uh, and it's not documented in history that the real John Riley had a wife. We know he had a son because in his letters that he wrote, he mentioned sending money to his son back in Ireland, but I gave him a wife just because I wanted to, to, to his story to mirror my father's story. And I think it's a more common story that immigrant men, when they come here, they leave their wives and children behind in their homeland. So I thought that that was more realistic for Riley to have a wife, not just a son without a mother. So that's what I did. And, you know, and I think it, it added more complication to his and Jimena's story and how they came together and that struggle, you know, of, of him um, having his wife, loving his wife, wanting to honor his wife, but also falling in love with Jimena at a time when they're at war and they're facing death every single day. And, and you know, so there's, their emotions were very heightened um, and they're trying to help each other survive. And the war brought them together in a way where I think part of the reason why their relationship evolves the way it does is because of survival. You know, they, they help each other survive some very difficult moments. Okay, are there more 
question. Uh, no, I don't think there's any more co questions, but I, I have a question. I have a question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tell me a little bit, how did you think about in, in integrating Santana and bringing Jimena to Santana to be able to tell that part of the story. Mm -hmm. how, did, how did you put those two and two together? You know, I, I think that was such a, a, a fantastic um, idea. Thank you. Um, I really wanted to explore Santana's story because I did, I, I, you know, like reading about him, I read a bunch of biographies about Santana in both English and Spanish. I read his memoirs that he wrote, although he lies a lot, you know, so it's like, you have to never believe him 100% <laughs> in his memoirs. And I was fascinated by him. And he's such a complicated historical figure, you know, he's like the most hated man in Mexico, but he was president of Mexico about 11 times. And Mexico in the 19th century, was heavily influenced by Santana. You know, I mean, he 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 was the commander of the Mexican army during the Texas Rebellion. He was the commander of the Mexican army during when the French invaded. You know, and then also um, he participated in the Mexican War of Independence. He and then he was a commander during the Mexican American War. I mean, he you know he he played this huge role in some major historical moments in in Mexico's history, and I was very fascinated by his by by him. And I was also disappointed of like whenever I see him portrayed in stories, he's always portrayed as a one dimensional villain. And like I watched the movie. Um, the Alamo, which is a terrible, terrible movie. They took way too many liberties, so it's not even historically accurate. And Santana is portrayed as this one-dimensional villain. And I was very angry about that. So then I wanted, in my own interpretation of Santana, I wanted to explore all his complexities and his contradictions. And, and to me, that makes a more interesting character, you know? because he, he, was, he, he was not a, a good man at times. He definitely was very bad for Mexico, but he's also very charismatic. And sometimes it's hard not to like the guy because he, he has so much charisma and this big personality. And, um, and so when I brought him into the story, you know, it's when he forces Jimena to become his personal nurse because he's an amputee. His leg was blown off by a French cannon and he suffers from chronic pain because the way it was amputated, it was done wrong. And so he suffered all his life from pain from his amputated leg. And so Jimena ends up tending to him. And in putting these two characters together, I was able to then... Um, really develop Santa Ana and for the reader to get to know this historical figure and to understand his motivations, his contradictions, and then his betrayal. You know, he betrayed Mexico. He betrayed the Mexican people. And because you end up liking the guy sometimes, I feel that the betrayal is also a lot stronger. Um, so I had a lot of fun writing him. He was actually my easiest character to write, even though I thought he was going to be the hardest. And he ended up just every time I sat down to write a scene about Santana, he just like took over my scene and then I couldn't get him to stop talking. You know, he talks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, I think it was a brilliant move to, to get up close to him. What a better what a better way to do it, what a better vehicle than to have Jimena herself become his personal nurse and get a really close up uh, glimpse of this man that, like you say, is so controversial in the history of Mexico. And yes, he is seen as a traitor, as a villain, but he is also um, a, a historical figure in Mexico. And uh, we like to create our heroes and and our villains in a very 
caricature way. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the books, the, the, the education books that are, you know, that are um, uh, published by the government for schools, for children, you read those history books, the government uh, edited books and, and the heroes are, and the heroes and the villains are caricatures. And yeah. I guess because they wanna do it more for kids or mm -hmm. I, I don't know, but the thing is when you read a story like this one, uh, you realize that not everything is what it seems and, and that things can happen that are so unlikely so out of out of I mean mm -hmm. yeah Irish army joining Mexico mm -hmm. <laughs> you know so yeah and that's a beautiful thing too I don't know if when you've gone to Mexico have you been to Plaza San Jacinto I have yeah. and I've seen the plague I've yeah. seen the the, the yes. yeah and the I've bus actually, the bust of John Riley. I would like it to be bigger and a big park around it, and you know, uh, but it is there, and people just pass by. People yeah. just pass by. Nobody really. This is a very, um, um, not a very popular story, and it should be. You know? Yeah. No. Yeah. Um, so we have time for one more question. If any, anybody wants to ask a question, okay. and you know, um, if you want to listen to some music, the Chieftains have a, a record, an album called San Patricio, which oh. is in honor of the St. Patrick's Battalion. Um, I also wrote, an, a co-wrote an original song for my novel. So if you go to YouTube and you Google a ballad of love and glory, uh, it'll pop up and you can listen to the song. And uh, yeah, no, this, this, I had a lot of fun writing, writing this song because, you know, I mean, the book is called the ballad of love and glory. And then I thought, well, I should have a ballad to go with it. <laughs> so, so I did that and, um, and it turned out pretty great as well. And then also, the audiobook, I really love the audiobook. Uh, you know, they, they got a Mexican actress, Yareli Arismendi and Maria, you're really good friends, and I'm, I'm becoming good friends with Yareli. Um, Yareli Arismendi is a great actress, and she read Jimena's chapters. And then they hired an Irish actor, Aidan Kelly, to read uh, John Riley's chapters. And so you get to hear the Irish um, brogue and, and he does such a great job changing the, the voices of the characters and it, it was amazing. So, so the audiobook is incredible. So I would recommend it as well if you like audiobooks. Yeah, well, uh, this, this, is a, this has been a wonderful conversation. I, I love uh, speaking with you. And uh, I don't know if uh, we still have some more time or are we? I think that's our time, unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> Raina, thank you so much for, uh, for being here. Thank you, Maria. Um, uh, such a great conversation. Uh, I would say buy the book, uh, the links in the chat. Um, you can uh, see our upcoming events on our website, wab.org. And I want to say thank you and have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank everybody. You. Thank you, Maria. Bye. Thank bye you. Bye.